This episode is sponsored by Bright Cellars, a monthly wine club that matches you with fine wine you'll love and delivers it right to your door. The holidays will be here sooner than you think, so now's the perfect time to order your first box of Bright Cellars to stock up on wines for your holiday parties or themed cocktails. Head to the link in the video description to take the wine quiz and get 50% off your first six bottle box, plus a bonus bottle. More on that later, now let's get down to basics. Alright, so the first thing we're going to make for our Swedish meatballs are some quick pressed pickles, for which we're going to need one large cucumber. You can optionally use a peeler to create a sort of pattern on the outside of the cucumber, but if you're like me and you're not very artistically inclined, you might end up regretting it. Either way, we are slicing it as thin as possible, either by hand or on the thinnest setting on our mandolin slicer, before commencing the quick pickling process, combining two tablespoons of white vinegar and two tablespoons of sugar, tiny whisk together until dissolved, poured over the cucumber slices, and then pressed to expedite the pickling process. So we want to weigh them down using a bowl that fits inside of our initial bowl, and then weigh that bowl down with something heavy like, I don't know, this will probably work. But on the off chance my apron becomes wrinkly in the next half hour, I'm going to use a cast iron pan. Then we're letting these guys sit at room temperature for 30 minutes, during which time we can prepare some herbs, an entirely optional tablespoon each, chopped fresh dill and parsley. That along with some kosher salt and freshly ground black pepper to taste, we're going to add to the pickles, give them a mix, and there you have it. The pressed pickles. Next up, I want you to ask yourself, have you considered the lingonberry? Where is it from? What is it? Am I saying it right? No one knows the answers to these questions, but we do know that Swedish meatballs are commonly served with lingonberry jam, and that if you can't find it, good old-fashioned cranberry sauce makes for an acceptable substitute. One pound fresh or frozen cranberries simmered together with half a cup each water and sugar until the berries have all burst and a thick jam-like consistency is achieved. Anywhere from 15 to 30 minutes, let it cool completely and refrigerate until ready to use. Next and last on our list of make-aheads is mashed potatoes. I have here three pounds of russet potatoes that I'm going to peel and cut into half inch cubes, throwing them directly into a bowl of room temperature water both to prevent them from discoloring and to rinse off excess starch. Go ahead and drain these once you're done chopping them and then place them into a pot with some fresh cool water and a whole bunch of kosher salt, covering, bringing to a boil and simmering gently for about 15 minutes until the potatoes are completely tender. Drain these guys and then it's time to mash using your mash method of choice. I like to rice. Once all the potatoes have been riced, we're following standard mashed potato procedure by combining one and a quarter cups milk with four ounces of unsalted butter that we're going to bring to a bare simmer before pouring over the potatoes and mixing until homogenous with a sprinkle of white pepper, a koi grating of freshly grated nutmeg, something I think works particularly well with the spices in this recipe, and just a whole lot of kosher salt to taste. And something I learned recently is that hot things taste saltier than not as hot things. So, you know, do with that what you will. Anyway, mashed potatoes, done. Next and last, the star of the show, the Swedish meatballs, for which we're going to grate half a medium onion on the large holes of a box grater. These guys are going to get sautéed until soft and lightly browned in a cast iron or carbon steel pan with one tablespoon of melted butter. Anywhere from three to five minutes over medium, medium high heat, adding a little bit of salt to help draw out moisture. Then we're spreading these out on a rim baking sheet to allow them to cool completely before we add them to our meatball mix, which we're going to start, as we so often do, by making a panade. Half a cup of unseasoned breadcrumbs, one large egg, half a cup of milk, half a teaspoon of white pepper, and an eighth of a teaspoon of ground allspice. Tiny whisk together into a smooth mixture that's going to help keep our meatballs moist and give them structure. Speaking of which, it's time to add the meat. You can use your meatball mix of choice. We want one pound of meat total. I'm going half beef, half pork. Add our onions and about a teaspoon or a big old pinch of kosher salt, and get to mixing this stuff together by hand until it is a smooth, homogenous mass one that we can begin to shape into meated balls, the Swedish variety of which are typically on the smaller side of the meatball spectrum. I'm shooting for no bigger than an inch so as to maximize my potential number of meatballs eaten in one sitting. Once everybody's formed up and impeccably arranged on a rim baking sheet, we're going to let these chill in the fridge for 30 minutes, helping them firm up and keep their shape before we start frying in that same carbon steel skillet wiped clean with three tablespoons of melted butter. These guys are really small, so by the time they're browned all over, they should be cooked through, but if they're not, you can finish them in the oven. The bigger concern here is burning the butter. We're going to use the butter to build the sauce. We don't want it to burn. The sheer amount of meat and moisture in this pan should help prevent that from happening, but don't overdo it with the heat. Keep your wits about you and don't be afraid to finish these guys in the oven. Once they're either cooked through or you're ready to build the sauce, it's time to extract these guys from the situation and build a roux in all that beautiful melted butter. So we're adding two tablespoons of flour to the pan and whisking it in with all that delicious fat, cooking for one to two minutes until the raw flour smell dissipates, and then slowly streaming in one 
one cup of beef stock, preferably homemade. If you don't have homemade, better than bouillon is a great alternative. Stream that in in little splashes, whisking constantly and incorporating fully before adding any more. This is going to help prevent lumps from farming in your gravy. Once all the stock's been added, we're going to add two tablespoons of heavy cream. Whisking until completely incorporated, and then this is not traditional, but both to darken the color and add a little bit of flavor, I like to add a teaspoon or two of soy sauce, which generally speaking works great with gravies of any kind. Season with a little pinch of kosher salt, a little sprinkle of white pepper, and a few twists of freshly ground black pepper. Then we're gently simmering this guy for three to five minutes until it reaches a nice, thick, coat the back of a spoon consistency, tasting for seasoning before serving. Speaking of which, it's finally time to eat all the delicious smells we've been making, plating up with our mashed potatoes, meatballs, lingonberry or cranberry jam, some of our quick pressed pickles, and of course, a whole lot of our rich, savory, flavorful gravy. You can finish cooking the meatballs in the sauce, but I think this looks a whole lot nicer. Make sure you hit both the meatballs and the potatoes. Optionally hit with a little garnish of fresh parsley and job done. Swedish meatballs better than you can get at any furniture store. That's a Babish guarantee. All it needs is some delicious wine from today's sponsor, Bright Cellars. Bright Cellars matches you with wine you'll love based on a quick and simple seven question quiz and ships your personalized box right to your door. Their wine education cards for each bottle provide information like tasting notes, suggested pairings, serving temperature, and origin. And this presents us the opportunity to make Glug, the Swedish mulled wine typically served with Swedish meat balls. This petite Syrah should do the trick with its notes of fruit and black pepper. Go ahead and drop the entire bottle into a large saucepan, along with the peel and juice of one large orange, and then in either a cheesecloth or this tea infuser, we're going to place two sticks of cinnamon, two whole cloves, and five green cardamom pods. And we're going to drop that in and realize at this point that you might need a saucepan that is taller than it is wide. So we're going to transfer it over there along with a third of a cup each blanched slivered almonds and a third of a cup of raisins. Then we're going to cover this guy up, bring him to a simmer, let him cook for five minutes, then let steep for 30 minutes before digging out the tea infuser, then adding one cup of brandy, whiskey, port, or if you want to be traditional, you can use aqua of it. Then you can optionally dig out the orange peels before serving up, making sure to dole out plenty of almonds and raisins in every glass. Now I used aquavit, which is a liqueur reminiscent of star anise, which turned out to be a rather unfortunate mistake. That is not great. <laughs> So make sure to use whiskey, port, or brandy, or maybe just stick to wine. Like this lovely medium-bodied red from Alanim. To try these for yourself, use the link in the video description to get an exclusive offer of 50% off your first six-bottle box plus a bonus bottle. 